Hey everyone, Janie here. Welcome back to my garden. So I am out in my side yard over by my beautiful cottage garden. It looks so good these days. But today I wanted to talk about my roses, particularly my Eden climbing rose that I have right here on this lattice arch from Kinsman Garden Supply. I have a lot of you ask me where I've gotten this arch. It's from Kinsman Garden Supply and it's the same arch I have uh, on my side yard that I have honeysuckle on. It's a beautiful garden arch. So when I, I have just deadheaded this climbing rose. So there's no blooms on it now, but it is so healthy. I can see there's new growth on it already. And I know I'm going to have a second flush here pretty soon. This rose was showing off just a couple weeks ago, particularly right over the time when I had my garden tour. So I just have to thank it so much because it was perfect timing. It was beautiful. I had over a hundred blooms on these two climbing roses and these two climbing roses I planted in November of 2021. So it's really only in its second growing season, which is absolutely crazy. So I had a lot of you ask me to give tips on how I grow my roses. And I was very hesitant to do a video on roses because if you all know, these these roses were the very first roses that I planted in my garden. I am not a seasoned rose grower. I am not an expert, right? I am learning myself, uh, but I've done a lot of research on it. I learned about it a lot in Master Gardeners and I've been obsessively, obsessively stalking websites, finding tips on growing roses, particularly in my area. But I think a lot of these tips will help you all out in different zones as well. So what I wanted to do today is I wanted to go over a couple of the things that I do for these climbing roses particularly that I really think have helped them out grow beautifully, stay disease free somewhat, and you'll see, and, um, and bloom just so prolifically in the second season. So let's get into it. So the first step I have for you all for growing beautiful climbing roses in your garden is to choose the right rose. And what I mean by this is I mean, give yourself the best chance to succeed. When you are looking for a rose, try and find one that you like that is labeled as disease resistant. What that means is that rose is really robust and can handle the different types of situations that will come out of rose, such as funguses, pests, viruses, and more. So when a grower labels a rose as disease resistant, you know that that rose is going to be able to perform better for you, even if it gets rust, even if it gets black spot, or even if it gets aphids. So when I was looking for a climbing rose to grow on this arch, which is in a very prominent position in my front garden, I knew I wanted a disease resistant rose so that I didn't have to worry about it too much. And so that's why I chose the Eden Climbing Rose. It is a fantastic disease resistant rose and it's very beautiful. Now that brings me to the second part of choosing the right rose and I purchased these Eden climbers from heirloomroses.com. This video is not sponsored. I just really feel strongly about this company. I really think it's a great company that grows roses and does a really really good job. They do not graft any of their roses. I think almost Every single rose that they have selling from their nursery comes from own stock, the, the rose's own root stock. So you can have a rose and that rose can be grafted onto another rose's root stock to make the rose grow faster or um, be a little bit more hardy. Or maybe, you know, I don't think that it helps with it, its disease resistance, but I, I think it helps with its vigor for grafting roses. And what heirloom roses does is they don't do that at all. They take cuttings from the mother plant and then they grow those cuttings into its own root roses. So the roots of my Eden climbing roses are actually Eden climbing roots. And so that's really going to help that plant. It's gonna help it be healthier. It's gonna get started a little slower than other plants, but Heirloom Roses does say that after the second year, it's absolutely equal to those of grafted plants. So it catches up very quickly. It's just those first two, maybe three years that are a little bit slower. But for me, I was willing to wait because I knew I wanted a nice strong rose that was gonna perform very well for me. They say that own root roses have, are, are shapelier and can 
handle things better and you don't have to worry about suckers from other random roses that have other rootstock, you know, and all of a sudden you get a red rose poking up or something like that. So choosing the right rose is my first tip. I think that that's a pretty easy tip, but I do feel pretty strongly about it. So the second tip I have for you is to be gentle to the rose the first year, kind of baby it a little bit. And I got this tip from Heirloom Roses again. Uh, so what they said, especially for own root roses, is that you have to be gentle with the new baby roots that are growing that first year. And they recommended for the first growing season, the first year, not to use granular fertilizer. So this is one example of granular, granular fertilizer, but there's a lot of different kinds. And basically what that can do is the granular fertilizer can burn those baby roots and possibly even kill your rose. It can def If it burns the roots, that root system isn't going to be as developed as it should be. And so your rose is just going to be slow to grow. So Heirloom Roses actually has a one-year guarantee and they, if you use granular fertilizer on your rose, you lose that guarantee. That's how strongly they feel about that. What they recommend is that you actually use a water-soluble fertilizer. And all the first year, I used this, this Neptune's Harvest Rose and Flowering Food. It smells terrible, but that's okay. That probably means it's good. I would just dissolve some of this in a watering can, and then I would water at the base of my roses. So that brings me to tip number three, and that is fertilize appropriately. So every zone is different for when you should start fertilizing your roses and when you should stop fertilizing your roses. So look up in your own zone when you should fertilize and when you shouldn't. I tend to fertilize, just to make it easy for myself, I fertilize once a month on the beginning of the month. And I use that water-soluble rose and flowering food from Neptune's Harvest. And I just fertilize these roses once a month during the growing season. I do skip a month or two during the hot, hot, summer. Uh, so usually around August, July and August, I don't fertilize those months because I don't want any growth during those months because it is so hot here where I live. We get up to 110. We got up to 117 last year. I didn't want any new growth on my rows. I don't want that stress on my rows. But every other month I did fertilize. I stopped fertilizing when the rows went dormant during the winter. Now that brings me to <laughs> fertilizing in the spring. And this was a new thing that I did for this rose this year since this rose as of November of 2022 I was out of that first year of having to baby it so I decided to use um, I got this recipe from Van Winden's nursery in Napa and Van Winden's nursery has gorgeous roses for sale there. I actually have a nursery tour coming up later this week, so stay tuned for that. As soon as it comes out, I will link it down below. I'm really, really excited to show you all. But they have a special rose fertilizer recipe, and they recommend uh, that you do this once in the spring, once you see three to six inches of root growth, or excuse me, three to six inches of growth on your rose to scratch in this recipe mix. So I have my ingredients here. The Van Winden's Secret Rose Fertilizer Recipe is one cup of alfalfa meal mixed with two tablespoons of Sol Po Mag and then a half a cup of rose food right? So I'm just showing you EB Stone. That is what I use. That is what I have. But basically you can get alfalfa meal, sulfur, that's sulfur, potassium, magnesium, sulfur, potash, magnesium, and then just a really good high quality rose food. Mix that all together. And then once you see those three to six inches of growth in the spring, that's usually around March for us, scratch this around the base and then water it in. I did that this year. And by early May, I had about a 100 blooms on these plants and I really truly think this secret recipe is really really great. Now I know it's a secret recipe. I actually have seen it in a couple other nurseries. So I think Van Den Van Winden's just said it's it's secret recipe, but I think it's a good one. So I'm going to call it Van Winden's secret recipe. All right, my next tip for growing roses is to watch for pests and disease and watch closely and watch often. Basically, you want to stay on top of it. So you want to, you want to educate yourself on the different types of diseases that roses can get and different types of pests, mostly aphids, right? We all know that aphids for roses. For If you have aphids on your roses, you can use a strong stream of water to get them off. I like the method of putting 
putting on a pair of latex gloves and squishing them myself. No, I cannot squish them with my bare hands like some of you can. I just can't bring myself to do that. But that seems to work the best for me. I was really lucky this year and I did not get a lot of aphids, if any, on these roses, which is fantastic. Now, you wanna look out, black spot is very common, powdery mildew is very common. What I am dealing with right now is rose rust. So rose rust is a fungus that you can get on your roses. It's very common in coastal areas, maybe like a little cooler, maybe a little more wet areas. Um, I live in central California where we're much drier, but it did say that it can happen on roses in central California, especially when you have wet winters. So just by researching this I've learned this and then as soon as I started seeing signs of rust on my roses I knew exactly what was going on and I knew to look up how to handle it I did not know off the top of my head how to handle it I thought how to handle it off the top of my head was spray a fungicide I follow the IPM pest management which is integrated pest management which basically means you want to use the less toxic approach first if possible so that's what I'm doing right now so let me turn the camera around and show you guys signs of rust on my roses and then tell you what I'm doing about it all right so can you guys see here there's little yellow spots on these roses and on the on the leaves excuse me and on the back of the leaves um, they're fuzzy it's really fuzzy and that is sure sign of rust. And like I said, rust is a fungus. So what, uh, I'll link my IPM website that I use down below. I use the California one, but I'm sure there's an IPM website for every single state that you guys are in. I looked up the IPM protocol for rose rust when I first noticed this. And instead of saying, oh, spray a fungicide, it said, Okay, well, keep your roses nice and pruned so that there's lots of airflow between the leaves. And then it also said, remove all of the damaged leaves and dispose of them, right? And if you see a lot, you can actually remove the canes, which is what I did yesterday. I removed a lot of them. I left some of them on so that you guys could still see it. I will come back here and I will remove all these leaves after I'm done here. Um, but I basically removed all of the damaged leaves so it doesn't spread anywhere else. Uh, so I'm going to go with that route until it gets bad like if it gets bad I am I will absolutely spray a fungicide and I'll have to do that like every so often basically what it says on the bottle usually once a week to once every other week and I'll have to do multiple applications which I really don't want to do and if I can avoid it I'm going to try and avoid it so basically my tip for you guys is watch for pests watch for diseases stay on top of it quickly so that you don't have to use the stronger stuff or so the rose doesn't get to the point where it's affected and you you can't bring it back. Now on that note, I do want to mention a virus that is very, very common east of the Rockies. It is not common here uh, west of the Rockies, although they have, ha they have found a couple instances of it, but I know a lot of you are east of the Rockies, and that is rose rosette disease. I have zero experience with this, but I did have a couple of you say in particular, make sure you educate people on rose rosette disease just so that they can take care of it. It is a very, very, bad virus for roses because it can spread very quickly. So rose rosette disease is a virus that causes excessive thorniness, excessive lateral shoot growth, witch's broom, leaf malformation, red pigmentation, and eventually death. So I wanted to show you all pictures of what rose rosette disease looks like. If you are east of the Rockies, this might be a big issue for you. So make sure you know what this looks like. So the first sign of it, you can take care of the problem. Those of us west of the Rockies, we don't have to worry as much, but I think it's still something that we should know about. So the next tip I have for growing beautiful climbing roses that have tons and tons of blooms is to train your roses correctly. So basically roses have main canes and lateral canes. Main canes are the big stems, stalks that come off of the bottom of the rose um, and they, they give the height of the rose. And then off of that main cane has little, they're called lateral canes. And lateral canes, they come off of the main canes and those are what produce the blooms. So what you want to do when you're training your rose, you want to make sure that your main canes 
are growing horizontally because then the lateral canes are going to come off the main cane and be vertical and that is going to give you the most blooms, those vertical lateral canes. So when you train a climbing rose on an arch, you can imagine if you have the main canes coming straight up and then horizontally coming over the arch, you're gonna have some blooms coming off of the lateral shoots as it comes up here, but you're gonna have the most blooms as that main cane turns sideways horizontally and then all the lateral shoots or the lateral canes are gonna come off and bloom beautifully on the top. That's why you often see rose arches with a bunch of blooms on top because that's where the horizontal growth is and that's where most of the blooms are produced. So I have zero proof of this. This is just my interpretation of that recommendation. <laughs> I took it a step further and this is where I was a little worried to talk about roses uh, to all of you because I'm so new and this is just something I was experimenting with. But I'm going to tell you anyway because I did show this in a video earlier and you know it, it's it's interesting to me. I always like to experience experiment in the garden. So what I did for these roses, I have the main canes. Let's see. I have like here's a main cane here here's a main cane coming off to the side what I did is I trained them in an S shape coming up here so instead of just having them go straight up I tied them in so that they were growing in an S shape I did the same thing over here you can see it's kind of going like this and then going like this and going like that can you guys see that so that main cane is growing into an S shape and then that allows the lateral canes to come vertically straight up and then produce more blooms. So there's a couple drawbacks of this. Really there's one main drawback of this. You don't want any damage on your canes. You don't want it to rub against something and cause a lot of damage. Uh, so if you live in a really windy area or an area that um, I don't know, maybe it gets brushed up against a lot. You might want to do this because there's obviously, you might not want to do this because there's obviously a lot more contact with the trellis when I do it this way. But I don't know, I really do think this gave me more blooms because I had more vertical lateral cane growth. Uh, so it's just something that I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to mention you guys, but the classic, uh, um, uh, advice to give when you train your climbing roses is you want to try and get as much horizontal main cane growth as possible so you could have more lateral uh, lateral cane growth and more blooms i hope this all made sense the last tip I have for you all for growing beautiful roses is to deadhead and deadhead often. I actually hate deadheading roses because I always feel so bad cutting off those beautiful blooms that sometimes still look kind of pretty even though they're a bit, bit wilted, but I know how important it is to deadhead. So I've told you guys this before, but I think it's worth repeating. A plant's whole purpose in life is to reproduce. It wants to create those seeds so that 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 plant can grow again the next season if the mother plant dies. So if you allow a rose to grow up, produce a bloom, and then allow that bloom to go to the rose hip stage or seed stage, that rose is going to think, oh, I'm done. I've done my job for the season. I can chill out and relax for the rest of the season, which means no blooms for us, right? So you want to snip that bloom off of that plant before it gets to the rose hip stage so that rose doesn't think it's done its job yet. It keeps working. It keeps producing more blooms so that we can enjoy them all season long. So the great Monty Don recommends deadheading once a week during rose, rose growing season. I think that that's a little bit much <laughs> once a week, but I think it is good advice, especially if you have more roses than I have, um, because it does get you out here, has you, it has you stay on top of the deadheading, and then you can also check your roses for pests and diseases. So deadhead and deadhead often. All right, everyone, so that is going to be it for my tips today. Again, I am 
not an expert on growing roses. I am just telling you guys what I've learned over the past two years and how I got these roses to perform very, very beautifully this season. And I'm excited to see the second flush of blooms and see how it does. So if you guys have any tips, you rosarians have any tips, please put them in the comment section down below. We would love to hear them. You know, we are all always learning as gardeners and so we can all learn from each other. So that's what's great about the comments section. So I hope you all enjoyed this and I hope you all have a chance to get in your garden today.